as with most of these videos that cover a similar topic, we need a couple, <clears throat> well, we need to establish some prior understanding in order to know what exactly we're looking at. <clears throat> so uh, under changing articles of a contract, states that contract modification uh, when negotiating a contract or after a contract has been signed, you may want to modify or change the contract. For the most part, all parties to the contract have to agree to modifications. Now, how, what exactly does that mean for a parties to a contract that is hundreds of years old? That's from legalinfo.lawyers.com. Is it legal to change a contract after signing? A contract modification refers to a situation where the contracting parties agree to change the terms of their original agreement. For example, when a person receives a job offer, the hiring company may require them to sign an employment contract, etc. Now, under revisionism, uh, in brackets, fictional, States an analysis of works of fiction, revisionism denotes the retelling of a conventional or established narrative with significant variations which deliberately revise the view shown in the original work. For example, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood revised the folklore tale of Robin Hood to de depict Robin as less ambiguously heroic, influencing all subsequent modern portrayals. Many original works of fantasy appear to retell fairy tales in a revisionist manner. Censorship. Censorship is a suppression of speech, public communication, or other information. This may be done on the basis that such material is considered objectionable, harmful, sensitive, or inconvenient. Censorship can be conducted by governments, private institutions, and other controlling bodies. Governments and private organizations may engage in censorship. Other groups or institutions may propose and petition for censorship. When an individual, such as an author or other creator, engages in censorship of their own works or speech, it is referred to as self-censorship. General censorship occurs in a variety of different media, including speech, books, music, films, and other arts, the press, radio, television, and the internet for a variety of claimed reasons, including national security to control obscenity, pornography, and hate speech, to protect children and other vulnerable groups, to promote or restrict political or religious views, and to prevent slander and libel. Specific rules and regulations regarding censorship vary between legal jurisdiction and or private organizations. That, of course, was written by some brain-dead moron, probably from an academic circle or possibly a computer program. Written, of course, by a brain dead moron from some academic circles. Fraud. Fraud, a deception practice in order to induce another to give up possession of property or surrender a right. Of course, that's a very rudimentary definition. A piece of trickery, a trick, one that defrauds or che a cheat. Fraud in law. Fraud is intentional deception to secure unfair or unlawful gain. Or to deprive a victim of a legal right, fraud can violate civil law or criminal law, or it may cause no loss of money, property, or legal right, but still be an element of another civil or criminal wrong. So isn't that interesting? Their definition of fraud itself is a fraud, attempting to circumvent what, in fact, fraud is. And we all, of course, know fraud to be, in essence, a deception, and that's it. Fraud is a deception. However, for it to be a criminal fraud, it's something else. Now, for our guiding star, I suppose, if you will, we can understand the most of the points, at least, of revision in the Constitution by following the preamble. The preamble to the U.S. Constitution is sets the pace for the document. It explains what the purpose of the document is. And when somebody revises something into a document that conflicts with what its stated purpose is, well, then you know it's not from the original author because they wouldn't write something in there that runs contrary to their stated purpose. Nobody's perfect. People make mistakes, sure. But Somebody who's intelligent enough to do something like this is not going to make mistake over and over and over again and basically revise the document to be the opposite of what the declared um, purpose for it is. As well, the preamble itself, yes, that can be revised, but it would be a lot more obvious and appears to retain its original purpose, even though some words may have been changed, such as the word union. Anyway, it states, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. Of course, it should be noticed the word, ensure domestic tranquility. That's possibly one of the most important ones, and also provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. 
and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So those parts in the preamble declare what exactly the document is designed for. And when we find revisions in it that appear to run contrary to that, well, that is a first and dead giveaway that it is not from the original author. Next, we go to the Second Amendment, which states a well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So there's two things to notice in this. First of all, a well-regulated militia is um, defined as a right of the people. So the people are that militia that is well-regulated. Of course, the regulation in here is not specified, but it is designed for the security of a free state. So if we are not living in a free state, then we do not have a well-regulated militia, which is done, made, formed up of the people. And all the people have the right to keep and bear arms, which shall not be infringed. So it does not give you the ability to regulate the keep and bear arms because it says it shall not be infringed for people to keep and bear arms. It does not specify which arms either. It just says arms in general. And so all of the regulations that we have contrary that are done under the name of the Second Amendment are actually run contrary to it. And in addition, cause uh, domestic disturbance because individuals do not want to have their right to keep and bear arms being infringed. And so they take up arms against the people doing it. And thus you have domestic uh, un un intranquility, right? It's, it's not... It's not tranquil. There's no tranquility. There's no people are not. There's no peace, right? Because you're constantly fighting with uh, a uh, with shackles. So yes, we are not living in a quote unquote free state of being. Anyway, now the next parts we we uh, next part we can look at that uh, helps us define what exactly is a revision in this document, of which there are quite a few is the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment, fortunately, is one line, very hard to revise, although I wouldn't put it past them to try and do so. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And so therefore, when you find things that conflict, one part that conflicts with another part, then you can be pretty certain that that's a revision. And if it adds up to all three elements of violating the preamble, violating one part, and then contradicting another, well, then you have the rule of threes, that is a obvious revision made by somebody who wasn't the author. And usually the motive behind it is very apparent from the context and also background information about what exactly these uh, corporate government so-called tyrants do and how they want to legitimize their corrupt criminal activities that uh, would basically help them avoid the noose. So we're pretty much only going to look at Article 1. We'll look at a few other parts, but ever since the revisions recently have been applied to this document online anyway, under constitution.congress.gov slash forward slash constitution forward slash, well, the document has become a whole lot more bloated and it would take a lot longer to dig through every single revision because they did just so much of it. In Article 1, Section 1, it states, All legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of Senate and House Representatives. This, of course, would be one of the primary focuses on their revisionist efforts in order to change the nature of the document and put it into uh, or legitimize their criminal uh, activities, their racketeering and things like that. The first part in this that stipulates uh, or that is an obvious revision is that the House, it's in just in section two, the first paragraph, the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. Now that's probably the original part. The addition is the, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. That is not like the clear and concise writing of the original authors. They wanted everyone to be aware of what these things mean and are. And then somebody puts in a convoluted passage like that at the end that clearly benefits one party, which would, of course, one party being, of course, the corrupt tyrants and not the people that live in each of the states. And so that would naturally lead to conflict and um, also violates other sections. And so you know that that's a revision. Next, we have the section 
uh, well, actually, first, I should probably specify that that one part above may actually be only partially revised. It might not be completely out of the original, especially with the reference to the branch of the state legislature, considering we also use the term branch for the military, but most of these other fraudulent corporate entities are called departments or um, offices, agencies, etc. But the militaries are separated into branches, and so that could be a theme of an old style, especially considering the branch of a tree, And but that goes down the rabbit hole a little bit. So in the next part on section two, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to a whole number of free persons including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the congress of the united states and within every subsequent term of 10 years now that's probably the original one uh, original section that's delineating or enumerating a specific way of taxing and according to other sections in the u.s constitution that's the only way that you can leverage a tax but then there's revisions in it that well, we'll look at that later anyway the part that's added is in such manner as they shall by law direct i don't know why they would need to add that one in there considering they are writing the law here the supreme law the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each still state shall have at least one representative, and until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts 8, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations 1, Connecticut 5, New York 6, New Jersey 4, Pennsylvania 8, Delaware 1, Maryland 6, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. It should be noticed there that it says Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. That's possibly something that was left in from the original you can't be sure but it's anyway there's no obvious revision there now this part when vacancies happen in the representation from any state the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies that is a very very obvious revision because they're basically stating that an appointed executive which it doesn't state which kind but we all know what that means really will be able to put and appoint anyone that they want against the will of the people that will obviously lead to conflict which necessarily uh is against the preamble and it violates other sections of the constitution as well and even those other sections that it violates may have been revised but the violation of the preamble itself is a clear dead giveaway that this is a very obvious revision. And it clearly benefits one particular section of the populace, which is those people who pretend to, who act under the color of the constitution while violating it. They are the corporate state government thugs and tyrants that go around doing things like this and operating behind the scenes and uh, engaging in operations against the nation and against the people for their own corporate interests mostly on behalf of foreign entities anyway but this clearly benefits certain individuals over the will of the people and is a obvious revision now also that revision that we looked up there which is very very apparent and the one below it is likely a revision as well but that one that we just looked at and read is in fact contrary to the paragraph the second paragraph of section three which is only three paragraphs below it whoever does these revising revisions and additions really because that's really an addition they're not actually changing any wording they're just adding something well they didn't read the document that they were changing because it states that <clears throat> if vacancies happen by resignation or otherwise right resignation or otherwise otherwise could be anything so basically if vacancies happen at all during the recess of the legislature of any state the executive thereof may make temporary appointments temporary whereas that one right above it only three paragraphs and they're even short paragraphs three paragraphs above it is stating the executive authority can fill such vacancies with quote unquote writs of election not only do they not talk like that, 
from the time period that that doesn't follow the pattern of speech and writing of the people from the period. But in addition, that is allowing an appointment to vacancy without stipulation of temporary uh, of a temporary nature, whereas below it it states a temporary nature. So there you have that con conflicts with a paragraph that's only three levels down. Somebody writing this document would not write something so egregiously convoluted and conflicting only three paragraphs uh, or, or with only two paragraphs of separation and they're short paragraphs too they're they're like one line so they maybe they can't even be considered paragraphs now the next part in this article that is a clear revisionist edit which would be an addition is that the senate shall choose their other officers there has never been any stipulation in the constitution about a senate or any people in the um, in the legislature being allowed to have quote unquote officers. The only part in the constitution that reference officers are judicial and executive officers, not legislative ones. And not to mention the constitution does not provide such a thing as a legislative officer because they wouldn't have, they would essentially be able to do whatever they want because they have no stipulated uh, responsibilities or on the other hand they wouldn't be able to do anything because again they don't have any stipulated responsibilities and anything that is not stipulated to these people that are pretending to run the so-called government well anybody who's fought, who's actually constitutional that is they can't uh, do things outside of it because that stuff's reserved to the quote unquote states and people respectively so they have to write the stuff in there but Again, there's no stipulated anything for so-called uh, Senate officers because the people who have Senate officers are in fact violating the Constitution with that garbage. And there's no binding oath to quote unquote Senate officers because again, they're not constitutional and this is an addition. And also a president pro tempore, right? Pro tempore. They did not write like that. They used a few, very few, very few Latin phrases like ex post facto. And we don't actually know if they actually did use the ex post facto, or rather that was a revision and translation from the English that they might've used then. They did not write this document to be confusing. They did not use in general terms in other languages without translating them and expecting the people reading it to know exactly what that word means. This document is supposed to be made to be clear. And these revisionist edits are made by somebody who's trying to twist and who's trying to obscure, and that tells you that this is a clear revision among other things. It also says, in the absence of the vice president, or when he shall exercise the office of president of the United States, when he shall exercise the office of president of the United States. This section could not be more clear, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next obvious revision. Now, these two sections below it are also clear revisions. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments when sitting for that purpose. They shall be an oath or affirmation, right? They shall be on oath or affirmation. Who writes like that? That's what a, a Roman, Greco-Roman imperial trained attorney talks like. That is not what the people writing this, you know, the merchant men and, and traders who wrote this document originally, that's not how they talked. This is clearly the work of a brain dead attorney who thinks they can get away with this stuff. When they well, you yeah, know, you can track people's edits through the admin and, and some, some admin or some uh, computer program did these revisions and edits. And of course, the people who told them or directed them to do it or did it themselves, well, you know, they are <laughs> engaged in a criminal fraud of the highest order, continuing considering they're trying to revise the supreme law of the land. That that is 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 not just treason. That's pretty heinous. Anyway, while the president of the United States is tried, the chief justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two thirds of the members president. So that violates a whole boatload of different parts of the constitution including the one that trial of all crimes shall be tried by jury not a chief justice quote unquote not to mention the chief justice is not something that is 
in fact, referenced in any other parts of the Constitution. Because the Chief Justice is not a constitutional uh, element at all. Although they could be, but it's not specifically referenced. It all depends on whether or not you're actually following the Constitution, which becomes really difficult when they do revisions like this and they add crap and they make the whole document convoluted and conflicting because they, in fact, are abusing and misusing and engaging in operations of warfare on behalf of foreign interests. Concerning bar card holders are all foreign agents. Anyway, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. And that's another thing that you can notice for these revisions. Anytime they add according to law, you know it's somebody who did not write this document who is revising it to have, bring on a different nature because the individuals that wrote this document when they wrote it were writing the law, so they would not need to put according to law into their writing. That's just, it doesn't make any sense. Unless, of course, you're a revisionist attorney who has to constantly pretend to, because you're acting under the color of the Constitution, you have to constantly be referencing law, right? But the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and so it would not write into all these other laws that are, yeah, it, it's just incredibly conflicting. <clears throat> and naturally, all of these sections that we see revised into it, all of them would violate the preamble, they would lead to conflict. They would not ensure domestic tranquility, and they would also deprive the people of, well, many, 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 many different things that the Constitution was designed to protect against. <laughs> now, the next part that we could look at is, well, there's two actually in Section 4, where the addition of, but the Congress may at any time by law, by law, right? make or alter such regulations, regulations. They did not talk like that, except as to the places of choosing senators. Now, choosing with an U was a, what somebody would call misspelling, but considering they didn't have standardized spelling at the time, wouldn't be, but you can see it in other parts. But the fact that there are so many areas that use the word choosing with a U as a spelling, that is somebody who's going through and they're trying to give themselves validity by making it look like this is based off the original document through a quote unquote misspelling. And in that case, it would be a misspelling because that's how they would see it. So they're specifically selecting that spelling to give validity to it. And you can see a pattern in these recent revisions of that word choosing with the U specifically popping up. So far, as I've seen, there are three sections in the Constitution that use that word in that spelling when in fact, originally there was only one. Anyway, it also states, Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall be on the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. That unless, that section, unless they shall by law appoint a different day, that's a revision. They would not have left it as open like that because the idea of the U.S. Constitution is to confine the individuals to specific responsibilities so that way the pre people can live in a free state. They would not leave clearly beneficial open amb ambiguity to the individuals that would occupy these offices. And they would also not write in sections that conflict with other sections leading to a war of argument and all these other things, right? They would not do that. This is supposed to be a closed and shut document. And so the revisions and the places like this want to open it up for them to be able to do essentially whatever they want constitutionally. <laughs> Now, the next part in section five, that's a clear edit, comes in two parts, essentially, where it states, and may be authorized, that is not a word they would have used, and they would not have used it in that way either, to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. That's obviously benefiting a tyrant somebody who wants to do whatever the hell they want and coerce and enforce people to go along with it, that conflicts with a large number of different parts of the Constitution. That's a clear revision. 
But underneath it, it also states each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Expelling a member, right? That is not a term they would have used in addition to disorderly behavior. Disorderly behavior is referenced in another part of the Constitution as essentially breach of the peace. That's how they would have referred to it. Disorderly behavior is clearly a, a this is clearly an edit because disorderly behavior is a word that recent generations would have used. And who knows, this might even be a quote unquote legislative officer or aide who is editing these sections. And they're showing their who they are because their cadence in in writing pattern does not match up with that of other parts of this document. Now I should also notice that down in the bottom paragraph, it states that each house should keep a journal of its proceedings. So there's no way they would have written like that. That's again, not following the cadence, but it also states, and from time to time publish the same, accepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. Well, I probably don't need to beat this dead horse, but that's a clear revision and it should be a very apparent exactly why it is. It runs contrary to the purpose of the document, conflicts with many other parts, including uh, it, it, uh, areas. Uh, it, well, actually, most of this whole section here is just basically garbage because it's nearly all revised to, to death. But that section, it's just, it's really, it's an awful revision. Now, among the other parts in this particular paragraph that are clear edits, such as the phrasing, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal, at large is not something that has been referenced before. There's other parts of this particular paragraph that are even more obvious and egregious. Here it states, if any bill should not be returned by the president within 10 days, in brackets, Sundays accepted, after it shall have been presented to him. That in brackets, Sundays accepted, that violates a boatload of other parts of this Constitution and is a clear edit by somebody who goes to church on Sundays. That is the somebody who follows a pattern of governmental appointed days off like Sunday they would write like that. Not the people who are establishing this document at the time. That's a clear indicator of the person you're dealing with who writes this, these revisions. They are dense. They do not comprehend how people lived at the time and how they wrote. So they put that in there because this is a government shill, corporate government, who is a slave to regulations and to behavior modification and habits. They have to always and constantly reference the weekends and federal holidays being off, always. And so when you they revise something and they put that really obvious addition in there, well, it's a, it's a dead giveaway, really. Now, the next part that is really just i mean this whole paragraph is, is awful right here it states every order resolution or vote to which the concurrence of the senate and house of representatives may be necessary except on a question of adjournment and there you have another bracket edit brackets by mind you are something that is an addition from recent times that would not be have been a way to for an addition in their time, because the times, the time that people were writing this, they used a lot of commas, and I mean a lot of commas. And so this person who's revising, when they use brackets, not only are they showing who they are, they're also showing that the grammatical pattern or cadence of writing is wrong, and it's a dead giveaway of who they are, considering where they have been trained to write in the uh, university propaganda system. Anyway, shall be presented to the President of the United States and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him or being disproved by him, shall be repassed. Who, like, 
that they, they would not have used that word repassed, right? Repassed by two thirds of the Senate and the House of Representatives, according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of a bill. Well, that obviously benefits tyrants and dictators who are pretending to be the quote unquote uh, Senate or House, the legislature. They're pretending to be the legislature, and so they have to write into these. It's, it's this document, the Supreme Law of the Land, in order to legitimize their crimes, vast abilities to stipulate anything they want in anything, which, of course, naturally is contrary to a lot of other sections of the U.S. Constitution. But we'll go ahead and ignore that because right now they are the voice of the Constitution. They say what goes. And when they edit and revise something in here that's so egregious and clear well, because it's supreme law of land, you can't do anything about it, and they control everything so they can say what goes, right? That's how it goes? No. No, these people are, and this person, because it's probably one individual, to be honest, that's doing these edits. It's probably some low-level admin who's running a computer program being told by somebody else behind them who are probably all bar card holders at some point or have at least studied in some manner like that because of their clear attorney patterns of speech. Well they are warranting the death penalty for doing things like this. And I'm sure that most people who, most people who are not involved in these corrupt schemes would agree because this is the supreme law of the land. And to revise this th document in such a way is possibly evidence of desperation where they have to legitimize their criminal acts because judgment day is coming for them and they aren't going to be sitting in the judgment seat as they have been previously. Now, this section here, uh, which retains a large number of one line, one single line things, right? Most of the stuff, as I can tell from past observation, they're not recent revisions. There's, as I can tell, there's no recent revisions in this particular section. That is not to say that some of them have been revised, say like the 1860s, uh, when the foreign corrupt uh, corporate machine took over, right, on behalf of the foreign investors in, say, the Vatican or in Switzerland uh, and London, etc. Well, this section appears to not have been recently revised because of the pattern of cadence, because I've read these things previously, and it, they, it all appears to maintain its original state as far as, say, last year. Whereas those other things that I was looking at, they were not contained in this document, uh, this online document last year. Now, in this second part, there are three specific sections that are awful and such obvious revisionist edits. The first one is says to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high scenes. Well, that's probably the original, at least as far as last year. But this end offenses against the law of nations, that looks like a newer edit because that clearly benefits the United Nations and foreign interests, contrary to domestic sovereignty, domestic tranquility, and everything else that is stipulated in the preamble. It's a sellout section, and there's no way that the people that wrote this originally would have written something like that in there. Also, it states to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. That was not at all part of the Constitution. That There's no way that that would have been written like that. Government and regulation, they didn't talk like that. In addition, it states that to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. Notice that, employed in the service, reserving to the states respectively. So they took that from a different part of the constitution, which is contrary to, of course, to the people. And considering the people are part of the militia and the people are the ones that are supposed to establish the law against these individuals doing these crimes, well, they are ignoring the section about the people obviously to their benefit it benefits a very obvious select group of corrupt morons that are doing stuff like this 
and it states the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. So the, all of those sections are clear revisions into of this document and they clearly benefit certain individuals. They're clearly contrary to both the Second Amendment and the preamble. But more importantly, the motive is very clear behind this particular section. They, above all, do not want to be held to trial by the true law enforcement, the militia, and they also have to legitimize their corrupt Gestapo thugs that we call police, sheriff, highway patrol, and all the other so-called law enforcement because all of those people are enforcing codes and edicts on behalf of foreign entities. And each and every one, if you can prove that they did it uh, indeed, right? If they indeed did the crime, then they lawfully can be sentenced to put to death right that's that's what waits for them because of what they've done and done against the people makes them enemies they don't have any rights they are enemy combatants and this particular section right here clearly benefits and stops that from happening it puts the control of the law enforcement mechanism into the hands of the corrupt against the Constitution, violating multiple sections of it, of course. But it also legitimizes their corrupt criminal enterprise of so-called law enforcement. In this next part, we find similarly three very obvious and, and awful revisions that just stand out like a sore thumb. The first one states to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States. Again, reference to the government of the United States and vested by this Constitution. Those, that pattern of wording does not fit with the writers of the time period and, of course, has all the other elements as well. but. Even worse, it states, or in any department or officer thereof. So there you get the clear motive that the individual writing this is attempting to legitimize the criminal activity of things like the Department of Homeland Security, right, department, or a quote-unquote police officer. Because those words right there are included for the clear motive of legitimizing their criminal activities. It also states that, well, this portion is important to note because it's an obvious, I, I mean, I, you, I don't know, the, the person who is doing this revising, if they're not a computer program, really, they're not good and they're not very intelligent because in this par first paragraph under section nine, it says, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 for each person. But then only two short lines below it, it states no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. There is only one constitutionally viable tax and it's defined as we saw earlier in this document according to the census or the number of people living in it. free persons mind you living in an area excluding non-taxed indians and also including those bound to service for a term of years that is the only tax that can be laid yet right above it two lines above it it says that a tax can be laid thus conflicting with that other part that's only two lines below it i mean i don't think these revisions could get any more obvious than that now we have some other really awful and clearly obvious revisions that benefit certain individuals that we all know about today. Uh, I mean, this stuff's just, it's so, but it's, it's, so, it's so criminal and so obvious at the same time. It's just sad. Anyway, it states, no money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Again, we have that reference to made by law, this, uh, this regurgitation or redundancy where 
this document is not being recognized as supreme law, despite the fact that it was stipulated as such in, uh, I think it was Article uh, 4 or 6 or something like that. Anyway, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money. Notice the way that that is worded. Public money. Not monies. Money. And not, not, it's, it doesn't follow the cadence of how the people wrote uh, in other sections of this very document. Anyway, shall be published from time to time. No title of nobility should be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present emolument, officer, title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Notice what that's saying there. And perhaps you will notice the revisions in it. But those, uh, as I can tell, are not as obvious as some of these other ones that we're looking at. Also, it states, no state shall without the consent of Congress lay in imposts or duties on imports or exports. Except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws. I mean, that 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 revision is, is just, it, it's so blatant. It's... It's, it really is exceptional. That provides the legitimacy for all of their little criminal activities that they've been doing when it comes to impositions on, on uh, commerce across the states. But it also violates multiple sections of this Constitution, including the preamble, and there's a clear motive behind it, which is essentially legitimizing the criminal activities that otherwise have been contrary to the Constitution, but because these people can control this online version of it, they can revise it to anything that they want, and they think they can get away with it as well. Now, the last part of, of this section states, No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter in any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Now, there's no new edits or revisions into that particular section, as I can tell, but there are possibly older ones, including that part down below, which is unless actually invaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. So that would allow them to lay a duty of tonnage in time of invasion. Why would they write that into this document? What does the laying of a duty of tonnage have to do with a defense? They're, they're pretending that it's based off of keep troops or ships of war in time of peace or enter an agreement or compact with another state. These things would not require an imminent danger clause because it's simply stating that without the consent of Congress, Congress can give the consent for certain elements in this but i don't see why they would need to lay a duty of tonnage or make an agreement or compact with any state in a time of invasion or an imminent danger the only reason for that to be in there would be to protect a foreign corporate entity that is acting under the color of the constitution and then they need to revise it and change it so that they, they can legitimize their criminal activities and of course get away with their campaigns of conquest using this document by writing in little tidbits like that that leave it open for them to do whatever the hell they want basically as long as they call it something then they can do that and the people writing this document would not have included stuff like that in there because this document was specifically written to curb that kind of behavior now the next part that we will we'll look at here which uh, is skipping a few of the other three articles or other two articles behind it because it's Article 4 because they're so bloated and this video would simply take too long to address all the many revisions and additions they have done here. But here under Article 4, Section 2, third paragraph, it states, No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. That is such an obvious revision. It's so apparent who that benefits. And that, I mean, I feel like I don't even need to explain that one. It's just so, it's so awful.
that's such an awful edit revision that clearly benefits one side over the other other and is put in here contrary to the preamble and against the people to make us all into slaves so that they can basically force us to do work for all of their nonsense and also make it be constitutional at the same time no that's wrong that's a crime that's a revision now some of these revisions aren't as obvious as other ones but what we're mainly trying to do in this video is highlight the most obvious revisions so that it is absolutely and unequivocally apparent that this document is not only being recently revised but doing so in a way that it will legitimize the corrupt people that are pretending and are at this point have control over these mechanisms so that they can essentially get away with their crimes by writing in illegitimate fraud into the document that in itself is a crime of which these people can be held to the death penalty for doing because of the implications of what it does and because they are in fact trying to damage and in fact bring war against the people of the united states on behalf of foreign interests anyway the next part is that congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the united states that's the United States Corporation, mind you. That's not the constitutional United States of America. And nothing in this constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. This is written here against the people. This is written in a way that it will clearly damage the property and interests of the people. And other sections of the constitution negate this section such as not construing any parts that conflict with other parts, right? Rights or privileges held by the people. And people cannot be deprived of property without due process and other things like that. Not the United States. The United States can be deprived of property without, used to, without due process and things like that because the United States is not listed in the Constitution, at least until now, as a formal entity. Now, it has been listed as a formal or otherwise juridic entity and thus has all the rights of a quote-unquote person, even though the people that were referenced in the Constitution before did not include juridic entities. Juridic entities are a new aberration of the corrupt judicial system that is pretending to be the arbiters of the Constitution and control it, as always. But, in fact, they are corrupt foreign uh, occupiers acting on behalf of foreign interests, and, of course, they are going to do revisions like this to try and legitimize their criminal activities because for what they're doing there really is no other form of justice other than death for most of these people unless of course you can hold them to get other information out of them and stuff like that but they are enemy combatants and they are doing things with the intent of damaging and creating mayhem and death among the people so that they can get away with whatever they want essentially and steal people's property it all comes down to that and this revision has to do with the theft of property and the property that they're referring to in here most likely and appears anyway to refer to real property or real estate because of the reference to territory terra of course meaning earth this has to do with theft of the land now the next part and i mean last part because this is just getting pretty tedious to point out all of these obvious revisions that are just so awful and and they just they, they conflict so horribly with all the other parts their their cadence and their their pattern of speech and of writing is just so clearly a modification by somebody of recent generations that because of the way that they mold people in the school system to talk a certain way to act a certain way it becomes so obvious that when they revise something especially when you look at things that were written in the past and how they used to talk and write. Anyway, here it states that provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. The people who wrote this document would not have written something so convoluted. That is the mind of a criminal attorney basically a criminal attorney who is attempting to argue their way into a pretzel so that they can get away with whatever they want and confuse everybody that's reading it it doesn't matter that 
what they're what the whatever they're saying here doesn't matter because it's written so in such a convoluted manner that was not the intention of the original document it also references year 1808 which is something that's basically copied and pasted from a previous portion of the article and that could easily be done by any sort of computer program what we might call quote unquote ai artificial intelligence even though it's not intelligent it's not artificial and as an artificial being, of course, the word artifice, it is just a computer program. It's not solid matter, essentially. But the section in here is just like the pattern of choosing being spelled with a U. In order to give themselves volition, they're taking certain parts of the Constitution that were written in some way and then adding it to other parts and creating this pattern of a standardized form of speech of which there was no standardized form of speech at the time so that's that is another dead giveaway and i'm not even going to go and uh, bother trying to un unravel this little web that they've written into here because it's really just useless i don't care what their intention was behind it because it's a revision and it will naturally be contrary to the co intentions of the constitution and to the defense of the people and the nation on behalf of foreign adversaries. Now, some clarification can be found in Google where it states that common law is the part of English law that is derived from custom and judicial precedent rather than statutes, often contrasted with statutory law. The body of English law as adopted and modified separately by the different states of the US and by the federal government. That is a de declaration that the so-called federal government and the several states are imposing English law and not constitutional law or United States of America constitutional law, which is the supreme law of the land. And in many ways, English law is contrary to that document, unless, of course, they revise every version of it and then it becomes synonymous with English law and essentially puts all the same crap that the people wrote the Constitution against back into force. But they've done it through fraud for so long that. Now they need to legitimize it because that's part of their plan, legitimization of their crimes. They are in fact acting on behalf of foreign entities and here it is directly declared that we are living under English law and not US constitutional law. So let's go ahead and look at a book written by a, well, it's a highly revised book as they usually are, but it's called The Law of Contracts by John William Smith Esquire, late of the Inner Temple Barrister at Law, author of Leading Cases of Treaties and Mercantile Law, etc. Sixth American edition from the Sixth London edition by Vincent T. Thompson Esquire, M.A. of Lincoln's Inn and of the Midland Circuit Barrister at Law, with notes and references to both English and American decisions by William Henry Raleigh, and with additional notes and references to recent American cases by George Charleswood, LLP. Philadelphia, T&JW, Johnson & Company, 53 Thread, Chestnut Street, 1787. Now, of course, as many know, the English form of government was imposed on us after the Civil War, and the Civil War was, in fact, the uh, pretense in order to reestablish foreign rule based off foreign investors. That's why we essentially lost domestic tranquility and domestic governance under the Constitution. So in order to get a better idea of what we're really looking at, we should go and look at the definitions that were written by an English lawyer, because that's all we have today. They have suppressed and destroyed and revised every single thing that we had that was original for us that would essentially be against their foreign control. On page 12, it states that for the sake of convenience, deeds are divided into two classes, deeds, poll, and indentures. A deed poll being made of one party only, an indenture between two or more parties. The names indeed of deed poll and indenture were, as you probably all know, derived from the circumstance that the former was shaved or polled. Of course, I don't think anybody would know that today, but I guess the guy writing it at the time thought that pretty much everybody was familiar with that. As the old expression was, smooth at the edges, whereas the latter was cut or indented with teeth like a saw. For in the very old times when deeds were short, it was for the custom to write both parts on the same skin of parchment and to write a word in large letters between the parts. And then this word being cut through saw fashion, each party took away half of it. 
and if it became necessary to establish the identity of the instrument at a future time, they could do so by fitting them together, whereupon the word became legible. That is essentially the scheme that most banks and other institutions still use today, in some cases with their little tearaway uh, things that they send in the mail, where it says, you know, uh, don't open or tear at the sides or something like that. I don't do that so much now, but anyway, they used to uh, even two years ago. So that's where indenture comes from. So one has to wonder what exactly does indentured servitude mean? Not to mention that sounds a lot like a, a scheme for keeping uh, keys to a cipher where you'll have two parts that will have codes. And when they're put together, they can essentially read the encryption or cipher. But what's with you only have one or if they're separated, then you can't read it because you need both. Next on page 14. It states that there are two ways of making contracts or agreements for lands and chattels. The one is by words, which is the inferior method. The other is by writing, i.e. by deed. However, deed, uh, as he'll, he'll specify, is actually the, a series of actions making deed and action. Doing something in deed is doing something in action. Deed being action, which is a superior, and because words are oftentimes spoken by men unadvisedly and without deliberation, the law has provided that a contract by words shall not bind without consideration. Of course, that's the English law, the one that we are being have leveraged against us. That's not the constitutional law. The constitutional law does indeed bind people with words as in an oath. You do not have to put it into writing. Anyway, as if I promised to give 20 leave to make your sale, denoro, and here again we go with that pattern of using different words without translating it where they could translate it and it would become apparent, but instead they leave it in that form because they're acting on behalf of the Vatican, so they leave it in Latin. Here you shall not have an action against me for the 20,000, well that's pounds sterling actually, the L for leave in French, as it is affirmed in 17 Edward IV, for it is, or for, uh, that would be like 17th chapter of Edward IV. For it is a nude pact. Nude, of course, being naked, but they don't translate. El ex nudo pacto non orator actio. So that means and without uh, a naked pact, without uh, action and voice. And the reason is because it is by words which pass for men lightly and inconsiderably or inconsiderately, but where the agreement is by deed, there is more time for deliberation. Essentially, a deed is what he's saying here, but or trying not to say, is that when somebody takes an action, they're doing it deliberately, thus you have state of mind, but people can say things all the time they don't really mean, and because they don't actually put it into action, it doesn't mean anything. They didn't do it. But when you actually put something into action, that shows deliberation, otherwise known as state of mind. Or premeditation is another word they like to use. For when a man passes a thing by deed, first there's a determination of the mind to do it. There you go, state of mind. And upon that, he causes it to be written, which is one part of deliberation. And afterwards, he puts his seal to it, which is another part of deliberation. And lastly, he delivers the writing as his deed, which is the consummation of his resolution. And by the delivery of the deed from him that makes it to him, to whom it is made, he gives his assent to part with the thing contained in the deed to him to whom he delivers the deed. And this delivery is a ceremony in law signifying fully his goodwill that the thing in the deed shall pass. That is a, that they, that is doing it in deed. It's taking a bunch of actions to prove that you are deliberate and you are doing it on purpose, essentially. Next, in part 15, it says, so that there is great deliberation used in the making of deeds, for which reason they are received as a lien final to the party and are judged to bind the party without examining upon what cause or consideration they were made. And therefore, in the case put in 17 Edward 4, put it thus that I by deed promise to give you 20 pounds sterling to make your sale de novo, that means new, here you shall have an action of debt upon this deed, and the consideration is not examinable, for in the deed there is a sufficient consideration. The will of the party that made the deed, and so where a carpenter by parole without writing undertook to build a new house, and for not doing it, the party in, I believe that's 11 Henry the fourth, or H, brought an action of covenant against the carpenter, 
There it does not appear that he should have anything for building the house, and it was adjudged the plaintiff should take nothing by the writ. But if it had been by speciality, it would have been otherwise, so that where it is by deed, the cause or consideration is not inquirable, nor is it to be weighed, but the party ought only to answer to the deed, and if he confesses it to be, his deed shall be bound, for every deed imports in itself a consideration. The will of him that made it, and therefore, where the agreement is by deed, it shall never be called a nudum pactum. There are, however, subdeeds deriving their effect from the statute of uses, that is, a bargain and sale, and a covenant to stand seized, or seized, that's interesting spelling, S-E-I-S-E-D, to uses, both of which are void without a consideration, the first requiring a pecuniary one, and the latter a consideration of blood or marriage. Contracts in restraint of trade are also, also are void, if made without consideration, although under seal. Now, this section, second paragraph in this page is very important, considering what we looked at. But again, remember, this is English law. This is not constitutional law. And the people who are operating here are operating based off of English law. And so they think in terms of English law to get away with their crimes. And so their edits into the Constitution are going to be based off of that concept rather than the constitutional concept, which allows a jury to make final decisions and essentially gives lead way to the people, the militia, to carry out the law, the supreme law of the land here, which is the U.S. Constitution. So the revisions are done with the mindset and a frame that operates from this definition here. But here again, you must observe another well-known and important distinction, namely that, though it is not necessary to show on what consideration a deed is founded, a party soon on it is always, on his part, allowed to show that he was founded on an illegal or immoral consideration for that it was obtained by duress or by fraud. So if they commit fraud on the U.S. Constitution, according to their English law, they can get away with it because their fraud voids the supreme law of the land in this definition here. In continuation, <clears throat> it is therefore a well-established proposition that a deed may be invalidated by showing that it is tainted by such circumstances, aka the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution being tainted by their fraud, therefore cannot be enforced against them, and their fraud goes unjustified or uh, uh, unaddressed. However, this is still, again, based off of the English principle. And it signifies not whether the illeg illegality objected to it be a breach of the rules of common law or consist in the contravention of the provisions of some statute, or whether the prohibition of the statute be expressed in direct terms or be left to be collected from a penalty being inflicted on the offender. Thus, in Collins v. Blantern, the consideration was the compromise of an indictment for perjury. In Copac v. Bauer, the compromise in election petition to Hindley v. M. of Westmouth, future separation between husband and wife. In these cases, the illegality consisted in the infringement of the rule of the common law, which looks upon such contracts as improper. So here's another thing to realize is that all of our court systems, all of them that we have today, they're all based off of the English structure. They have judges appointed over groups uh, over the people, right, over the law enforcement of the Constitution, the people, the militia being the people. And these judges, their decisions are final. Whereas in the Constitution, it is not the judge's decisions that final because the judge isn't really even referenced. To, well, it is now, but the judges were not as heavily uh, leaned on uh, in the original Constitution. The revised editions, of course, are um, follow along with this uh, English garbage, foreign, naturally. Well, it was uh, the people or the juries of people being the militia, the law enforcement, their decisions were and are final, but they are not now because we are not living under a constitutional republic. Now, you cannot look to the Articles of Confederation, so-called, for their help because these documents are clearly frauds on their face, especially considering the perspective of the writer and for whom it would benefit. Anyway, it says, to all whom these presents shall come, we the undersigned delegates to the states affixed to our names send greeting. Whereas, right, 
it starts with whereas. And when we even look at that older writing form, the judge from England does not use whereas in the same way that modern attorneys do. This is written in a modern time by a modern attorney because they use whereas as the first starting word for many of their articles. Anyway, it states, whereas the delegates of the United States of America and Congress assembled did on the 15th day of November in the year of our Lord, 7,777, and in the second year of the independence of America agreed to certain articles of confederation and perpetual union between the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode, Rhode's land, that's interesting, or Rhode's land, and the Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia in the words following. Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union between the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Article 1, the style of this confederacy shall be the United States of America. Notice style is spelled with an I, but that doesn't mean that this is in fact legitimate. Article 2, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence in every power, jurisdiction, and right which it not by this con confederation especially delegated to the United States and Congress assembled. This stuff's so, 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 so bogus. Next we have, no state without the consent of the United States and Congress assembled shall send an embassy to or receive an embassy from or enter into any conference agreement, alliance or treaty with any king, prince or state, nor shall any person holding any office of profit or trust in the United States or any of them except of any present emolument of office or title of any kind, whatever from any king, prince or foreign state, nor shall the United States and Congress assembled or any of them grant any title of nobility. No two or more states shall enter into any treaty, confederation or alliance, whatever between them without the consent of the United States and Congress assembled specifying the accurately the purposes for which the same is to be entered in and how long it shall continue. No state shall lay in imposts or duties which may interfere with any stipulations and treaties entered into by the United States and Congress assembled with any king, prince, or state in pursuance of any treaties already proposed by Congress to the courts of France and Spain. Now isn't that convenient? Well, Article 8 is even worse. All charges of war and all other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or general welfare and allowed by the United States and Congress assembled shall be defrayed out of a common treasury, which shall be supplied by the several states in proportion to the value of all land within each state granted to or surveyed for any person as such land and the buildings and improvements therein shall be estimated according to such mode as the United States and Congress assembled shall from time to time direct and appoint. That's how it's done today. That's not how, how they were doing it at the time, according to other anecdotal and corroborative evidence. But that is very clearly how it's done today. They have surveyors that go around, figure out the value of the land, and then steal it from people under the guise of public interest when in fact it violates multiple other sections of the Constitution and is done against the people on behalf of foreign corporate interests. Also states the taxes for paying that proportion shall be laid and levied by the authority and direction of the legislatures of several states within the time agreed upon by the United States and Congress assembled. They would have not given such a blatant and open power, so quote unquote, to that body of people so that they can go around and lay excessive taxes willy-nilly considering the constitution it stipulates only one tax is allowed even though there's revisions including all these other taxes as well which is the word they use for it tax right now uh regarding the other parts of this document we're not going to go through the whole thing because it is again extremely bloated just like the constitution has become with all of the revisions and it would take forever to pick through all of the different nonsense that they've included in it but as far as I can tell, this entire document of the Articles of Confederation, so-called, from the Library of Congress, again, it's our fake corporate Congress that's doing this stuff. Well, the whole document is fra a fraud, as far as I can tell. Anyway, I mean, there might be a few parts here and there, but mainly speaking, the Articles of Confederation are, aren't real, and they never happened. And they're not the supreme law of the land, so they don't really matter anyway. But they do give you an idea that these people will touch and revise everything. And the fact that they have such clear and obvious edits in the revision of the U.S. Constitution, 
I believe, clearly has to do with English law on the statute of frauds so that they can get away with it by voiding the document with their own fraud that they did in that purpose to begin with, to get away with their crimes. The United States and Congress assembled shall also have the sole and exclusive right and power of regulating the alloy and value of coins struck by their own authority or by that of the respective states, fixing the standards of weights and measures throughout the United States, regulating the trade and managing all affairs with the Indians, not members of any of the states, provided that the legislative right of any state with its own limits not be infringed or violated, establishing and regulating post uh, offices from the state to another throughout all the United States and exacting such postage on the papers passing through the same as may be requisite to defray the expenses of said office. So it is very important to point that the first part of this paragraph is clearly from the context of somebody who is a corporate dictatorial thug, tyrant, who wants to get away with whatever they want and they dictate to anyone whatever they want because the laws do not apply to them. Their laws are done through dictates to everybody else. It is clearly a violation of the interests of the people and obviously not written by the individuals that established the stuff in the first place. But the second part is very important to note because it is the current system that we have today and it establishes the legitimacy of a fraudulent postal system. Here, again, it states establishing and regulating post offices from one state to another throughout all the United States and exacting such postage on the papers passing through the same as may be requisite to defray the expenses of said office, appointing all officers of the land forces in the service of the United States accepting regimental officers, appointing all the officers of the naval forces and commissioning all officers, whatever in the service of the United States, making rules for the government and regulations of the said land and naval forces and directing their operations. That's clearly not written by the people who designed the constitution. And articles 11 and 13 are really, they're really awful. Even though they are written in a mostly pattern based uh, a congruent pattern as to the old writings of say maybe the uh, early eight, uh, 18, 19th century and early or well yeah early 20th century and late 19th century i mean well these patterns still do not follow the same patterns of speech as somebody from say the 18th century when this document was allegedly made but more importantly, all of these articles in here come from the uh, perspective of a dictator who is a corporate thug, essentially, and who wants to take from the people against the will of the people and dictate to them. And so all of these are written from that perspective. They are not giving to the people. They are attempting to take away from the people and control the people whereas the people in the Constitution are the law enforcement. Anyway, Article uh, 12, all bills of credit, admitted monies borrowed and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States in pursuance of the present Confederation shall be deemed and considered as a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction wherever the said United States of public faith are hereby solemnly pledged. That is so awful. That is awful. That puts into place all of the phony and fake debts of the co continental period, contrary to a declaration of independence and domestic governance. That's putting all that crap back into place, no matter how fraudulent it was. And there's no way they'd have written something like that. This is just awful. It's really awful. And I wouldn't say that's a revision because I don't know if the Articles of Confederation were legitimate to begin with. Anyway, thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please uh, like it, share it, subscribe, subscribe to my channel, check out my other content, uh, join my newly made Discord, uh, check out uh, the free books that are available at the links, and also, if you so desire, you may support my work at any of the options available, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, buy me a coffee.